everybody back. It's 11.15. I hope you had um, time to do something interesting uh, during that uh, uh, short, short break. Um, we're going to, without really further ado, I th I'm just going to remind people of some of the, the key things that's worth uh, noting, um, just in case anybody's joined us who were, were not at earlier sessions. So just welcome for those of you who are new to this session on developing pedagogic content knowledge. Um, there are going to be three presentations. And I'd just like to take an opportunity to remind you of a few things. Uh, apologies to those who have already heard um, me say these uh, previously at the previous sessions. Um, Thank you all for coming. We do have the presenters here, I think. I've just noticed that, that, that they are. And um, we have some moderators who are supporting the session and they'll be managing the recording. Just to remind you that the session will be recorded um, and the recording does pick up the chat. So if you want to post a question anonymously, you can message the moderators or directly message me as Paul Redford um, through the chat box and I will take an opportunity to ask the question. There will be 10 minutes per presenter and about five minutes for questions and we'll try and keep to time um, but just to remind you that the conversation doesn't just end here it does continue throughout this week and beyond um, in the asynchronous session on the website um, and uh, through advanced HE connect um, uh, beyond that but if you want to post a question please feel free to post it in the chat I will try and summarize those um, and, and select a question at the end for um, the presenters before we move move on to the next presentation just to remind you again that the um uh, these sessions will be recorded and the the recordings will be made available um if you go to the symposium program and follow the links from the program you should take you through to the main site and exhibition area but also where the um, presentations will be recorded and there's an opportunity for discussions there as well um just to note, this session is being recorded at the moment, and so I'm going to, um, without further ado, um, pass over to Alex for the first presentation. Thank you. Um, my name's Alex Morgan. I'm presenting you to you today with my colleague Emma Jane Milton. We're both from Cardiff University, and we're going to talk about educative case making, um, something we've been working on, and that we feel is a learner-centered approach to supporting. Um, and developing practice in education. Our field is education, and much of the way we work is based on drawing on our understandings about this um, when working with colleagues. So, Sorry, just I, I wonder whether is it just me? I seem to have uh, lost audio on that. I just wanted to just double check. Can, um, yes, OK, so a number of us have just dropped, dropped some audio on that. I just want to check whether uh, there's been Alex's. OK, can you hear me now? Sorry. Yes, yes. What was well the last thing you heard? Did you hear about the, we introduced the title? Uh, yes, we heard you introduce the title. We definitely heard okay. you at the beginning and, and introduced the session. OK, so I'll, I'll, I'll move on and talk about why we think case making is a good idea and we should bother about it. Um, it's because um, it draws on Shulman's ideas of case making and bases um, and aligns with his assertions that the development of expertise in teaching requires knowledge of the content, knowledge of pedagogy and knowledge of students. And we agree that a cornerstone of developing this is a robust and deep understanding of student experiences. Academics in higher education are often appointed as scholars in their very specific field and, and usually have a really sound understanding of content knowledge. But it's less likely that they've developed uh, an understanding of general pedagogical knowledge, you know, the principles of supporting learners that transcend subject matter, um, understandings of the broader curriculum sometimes they're working in understandings of their students as learners and and specifically and and Helen's already talked about this pedagogical content knowledge that specific craft of successfully communicating ideas in their field so for us it draws upon this approach to case making that Shulman used with educators but it takes it a little bit further in that it encourages participants to draw extensively 
on collaboration, collective critical reflection, wider reading, and, and, and developing deep understandings in, in the case they identify. Okay. Educative case making is a narrative approach to considering participants' educational experiences over a sustained period of time. It allows for a deep consideration and articulation of these experiences through an iterative process of collaboration and supports the development of a critical dialogue, helping them to make sense of their experiences, to deepen understanding and develop expertise. We've used this way of working with academics, with students, with teachers, and, and whoever the process has been undertaken with, we found there to be very, very rich learning opportunities for all involved, for the participants and for those we share output material with afterwards. In our experience, it always needs as an activity to be carefully tailored to the different and specific contexts of the participants with whom it's being done. It doesn't matter if it's experienced educational professionals, whether it's students in pharmacy, you've really got to know why you're doing it and how you're going to do it that will meet their needs. You can have a very specific focus. We've given some examples below. Um, for example, experiences of assessment practices at a specific time on a specific module. Or it might be more general, just something that students have found challenging has left them feeling unsettled or something that they feel has been really unresolved perhaps about their experience of learning in the first year of study. Okay. So in terms of um, recruiting um, to this, we have um, generally worked with about 15 to 30 participants. Um, we think the process can be manipulated for larger group as long as the purpose and expectations are clear. And it needs these expectations need to be mutually agreed with those who are familiar with the context in which it's being done. So our first session was a briefing session with whoever the participants were. They had an overview of the process, the option to opt out, and a clear understanding of the kind of Chatham House rules and ways of working um, that we would adopt. We needed to encourage them to be able to contribute freely and honestly. And that takes encouragement and reassurance. You have to establish trust. And it's essential to create a context in which everybody can be honest with each other and honest with themselves. Um, sessions one to three are all about three hours long and done workshop style. Session one is a discussion about the chosen experience. At the end of this session, after much discussion, the participants create handwritten posters and um, we set up a gallery activity all around the room. Oh, I don't think our poster was originally that way around, but you can see um, on the side a poster there from that gallery activity with lots of post-its on it because that was the collaborative critical reflection um, about the posters where others went around and added their thoughts, their reflections. Um, in the second session, participants have the opportunity to undertake a detailed reflection on and write up of the case based on what they've already written on their poster, what they've already discussed. This is a, typically about three to four sides of A4. It takes considerable thought to produce. It's considered content. It's a point at which participants are really digesting and thinking about those conversations they've had with colleagues and what this case is really about. And after that session, um, the organisers of, of the educative case making process um, complete glosses, written feedback to the student or the academic about that case. And those glosses challenge, they critique, they disrupt the thinking further to develop a deeper understanding of what is really going on in some way as is appropriate to the uh, situation the participants in, informed by our understandings of pedagogical practice from the literature. And you'll see the final product on the next page um, from session three, 
where participants have refined and distilled the written case, that extended written case down to key points before producing um, a summary poster. And now I'll hand you into the capable hands of Emma Jane and she'll take you through the next slides. Thanks, Alex. Okay, so as you can see, Alex has talked about the final poster that the students produce about each of their cases. And this is quite a detailed piece of work. And what's lovely about this is they go from this very long narrative that they've written, which has required significant thought, real depth of thinking about their situation, their issue, their challenge, whatever it is that they're exploring. And then they have to distill it further in a way to produce an academic poster. We used this because we felt it was a really lovely way of them being able to communicate and acquire other skills that are important um, throughout their time at the university. Um, so some of the essential points that are needed when you undertake this case making approach is a clearly articulated motivation and buy in from leaders around um, the, the process to ensure that if you're going to do it, everybody is, is subscribed to it and there will be action as a result from undertaking it. Um, the participation is voluntary at all levels, so you can't apply this to a school, you can't make a school or a department do this process, you can't make a set of students undertake this, it needs to be voluntary and that's partly why um, we think we get as, ri as rich data as it uh, coming out of it, because people feel really engaged in the process. It takes dedicated time, you need space to work collaboratively in small groups, and you also need staff who understand the process and the ways of working, who can structure it, who can ensure that there are ethical ways adopted throughout the whole process, because it does require honest conversations. It really draws on people's lived experiences and you create an environment where people feel valued and feel that they can share set honestly about their experiences. Throughout the whole thing, you're encouraging dialogue and and, and pacing the sessions so that students get through their thinking or participants, because we've done this with academics, through their thinking about these processes um, at the right time for each stage of the process. The other thing we've experienced is the externality and mentoring from people who've done it before is a real, really crucial element. Moving on to the benefits, what we've found in our experience with, with all sorts of groups that we've done it with is a real genuine and considered participant voice. There's real time and space for collective reflection, and that fosters in itself the notion of honesty and, and how can I do things better? How can I change as a result of, of exploring those experiences? It does move beyond the superficial compliance that we often see um, with student voice and student feedback, and it really um, challenges things that are rushed and tokenistic because people have to have time and space to think and engage in it. It's in-depth and it illuminates aspects of practice, which often can be real gold dust. When we put the posters up on the wall in the gallery activities, you spot nuggets there that of experiences students have had, sometimes consistently, um, that you suddenly realise, gosh, they're interpreting that in a particular, a particular way. More benefits is, is there's real dual learning for both participants and the facilitators. We always learn loads doing this but also the students or the participants, the academics we've done it with say, gosh, I've really learned something about my practice or the way I approach things. So it's really valuable professional learning. There are real opportunities for quick wins, medium term improvements um, and longer term institutional wide benefits and learning. We've changed things institutionally as a result of taking this process. And we've also done things that we've been able to change in semester, in programme, very quickly to respond to student voice. Um, one of the things we've been delighted with is that with all participants, whoever we've done it with, they've been really positive with how the session has worked or the process has worked. There are limitations, obviously. There does need to be a commitment for responsive action, otherwise it's a waste of time and, and potentially disingenuous and, and I, I, even unethical. If you say to people, we're really going to listen to you, we're really going to try and understand your experiences and then you do nothing with that, that's really quite problematic. It isn't a quick fix, time hungry, it takes time, but it's really rich. And I've talked about the benefits um, that come out of that. It does need careful and sensitive management because all participants in it can feel vulnerable because they're having honest conversations and considering and sharing personal learning experiences and actions. 
We've done it generally with small numbers of participants. We do think it can be adapted, but you have to be really clear on what you're hoping your purpose is for this process. Um, but it really does look at context and, and what you tend to find is similar things emerge that can then be sense checked with a larger group of students. So we're going to stop there in case there are time for any questions. Paul, I, I'm hoping we haven't overrun. Um, we've done our best to stick to our 10 minutes. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. No, no, no. Timing's really good. So we're we're all we're all good on that one. So there's been a couple of questions um, that have come up. I think there may be some some more during this, but I would just like to pick up a couple of questions that have come up in the chat. Um, one question around: Is there a danger of social desirability bias in these poster presentations? In that participants trying to say what they think is acceptable to the viewers? I just wondered if you wanted to just talk through a few minutes on that. Sure, um, Paul. I think I think. The point here that's been really important for us is that there's always been an element of external externality. So we've done it with colleagues in a different school. We've done it with colleagues. Um, so so you're not you, you you create a situation where pe you set up a culture of working and a way of working that encourages those honest conversations, and people are not talking directly to to lecturers or staff that they might feel uncomfortable saying some of the things they want to say. Alex, do you want to come in there on anything? Yes, I mean, it's interesting. The setting up of this is so important. I'm, I'm thinking when we did it um, in pharmacy, actually with students, where the programme director stood at the front and say, I'm completely engaged with this. I want to do this to find out. And the reassurance we had to do when working with students, that everything was on the table. We did have students say to, come to us and say, is it OK for me to say this? And so there was that finding their way in the beginning to make sure it was OK to do the full and frank and free, because it isn't the way of working that they've learned. They've learned to work within the rules we all know exist. Um, and so getting them to step out of that does take quite a lot of support and reassurance. And you've got to be sure that you're going to be working ethically and that it is fine for them to share. You've got to have people on board working with you, and that's why you can't have pressed men to do this kind of um, activity. Thank you for that, and that really fits with the the earlier discussion around setting up the, if you like, the psychologically safe culture in in uh, these these environments. Um, I'd like to pick up another question as well that's come through on the chat around the, the division between engaged learners. You talked about volunteering for this and those who are less engaged who don't volunteer. I wonder if you talk talk a little bit about the role of the student engagement and are you taking either one perspective or how would we engage some some learners um, who aren't necessarily engaged given this is a vol voluntary process? OK, we've done it in a range of situations and um, we, we always do invite volunteers to participate. We've been really surprised. We've had different experiences in different contexts. Sometimes we've had just the right kind of number of people volunteer in other situations we've had waiting lists people desperate clamoring to tell us what they think and to to really engage in that way what's also been interesting is because some of what comes out of this at the end are, are can be themed that they're things that you kind of start to recognize about the shape of a program or the approaches of teaching is that we can often take those back to a larger group of students maybe some of the more disengaged students and sense check it and, and work out there whether this is an experience that's limited to those students who are engaged and, and, and on board. I think one of the things that's interesting about it is, is once you create the right kind of culture, students are more engaged, more enthused about being, about wanting to become involved. I think they see it as a very different way of engaging with staff and learning about themselves as learners. Same goes for academics when we've done it with academics. Um, as opposed to just thinking about it's not because it's not orientated to their subject content. Alex, do you want to say anything? Um, I think in terms of um, participation, yes, it has been interesting. You just can't, it has to be voluntary. You can't have um, academics or students I think forced to do it as an entire year group um I, th I think it would be problematic and you would start to get some of the um kind of made up narratives if you like and um, because it was something we just had to do so then it becomes a more tick box exercise 
I think it absolutely um, needs to be something that people are willing to participate in and want to find out, want to be genuinely honest. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much for that. And, and I think that's really interesting because that does also, you know, this is part of getting people more engaged in that process and, and, and actually just the nature of this activity demonstrates the level of one, setting up a, a culture of trust to have those conversations as well. So um, thank you for that. I'm, I'm aware of time, so I'm, I'm now um, 